we'll crack on. So I wanted just to say, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Um, welcome for to another episode of Stuart's Soundbites. 15 minutes, um, that's all it takes. I hope you've got a coffee and just enjoy the next 15 minutes, which will be great. Um, we're covering a really important topic today um, and something that I think e everybody can relate to. Um, and we're talking a little bit about self-image and um, particularly for um, people after the sustained spinal injury. And we're I'm absolutely delighted to have Simon Pinnell and Lady Marie Dawson Malcolm today, both from the Spinal Injuries Association, do lots of work with the SIA. You'll all know all about that. We'll post all of the links and all that stuff. Um, but Lady Marie and Simon have a really unique kind of insight into this stuff. And wanted to talk about it. And I think it's really important, generally speaking, isn't it? Um, because there are so many uh, more conversations being had now about self-image and social media and mental health and all of that sort of stuff generally. <clears throat> but I think self-image after spinal injury is something quite unique. So um, that's a really long-winded way of saying thank you for being here and welcome. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, I, I wanted to start off just to kind of, I suppose, on a bit of a, a more kind of personal note, you know, drawn on your personal experience and, you know, what, what your experience is of self-image um, after spinal injury. What's your own experience? Lady Marie, do you want to go first or shall I? You can go first, Simon. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I think for me, when, you, when you're going through... Uh, rehabilitation as, as part of your spinal cord injury uh, treatment, you don't really have a self-image. It's, uh, I think one of the phrases that was used to me was leave your dignity at the door when you go into the spinal center, just remember to pick it up on the way out. And at the time that you're doing your rehab, the rest, you know, almost the, the entire rest of the world is living in jogging bottoms, trainers and t-shirts. Mm -hmm. That uh, seems to be the uniform for anybody in the spinal center. It's not until you go out of those doors and back into the big wide world that you realize that, yeah, you, you know, jeans and smart trousers and shirts and ties and suits and all of that sort of stuff still exist. Mm. And that's when you start getting a bit of a, a feel for your own, your own self image. Because, <clears throat> you know, when you go out to, for the first time as part of your rehab, you then become very conscious of what you actually look like. Um, I was fortunate, I did my rehabilitation at Stoke Mandeville uh in Aylesbury you know biggest spinal center that we have in the country people in wheelchairs are not a novelty in Aylesbury mm. you've got Stoke Mandeville the home of the Paralympic Games they're used to seeing people in wheelchairs Lady Marie uh, may have a different view on that but I I didn't feel that everywhere I went people were sort of looking at that person in the wheelchair going past I didn't mm. get that but when you go somewhere else you become quite attuned to that and notice it yeah yeah, but, well, for me, I did my rehab in Stanmore Spinal Unit. And like Simon, it was tracksuit trainers. I was even told at one point that I will no longer be able to wear bras because of the bones, and because of the wires and all of that. And I'm like, oh, my God, my life is over. That's what I actually thought, because before, prior to my injury, I was a very what I would consider glamorous, love my high heels, my mini skirts, you name it, you know, I stopped traffic. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> You're and still then, glam. You're still glamorous. And to, be told, to be told that you can't wear a bra anymore and just live in tracksuit and trainers, that was not me. And so it was a bit of a difficult time for me, you know, to, it being in a spinal unit and uh, Simon said being in Aylesbury, he saw lots of wheelchair users. Where I live, I didn't notice any wheelchair users. And mm -hmm. so when I left the unit, I avoided going out. I didn't want anyone to see me. I remember the first time going to my local market, which I used to go to quite often before my injury. And I hid. I went around the back way because I didn't want anybody who knew me to see me. And so it was hard for me. And for the first few years, it was tracksuits and trainers yeah. and avoiding bras and avoiding looking in the mirror because I didn't want to see myself until one day I caught sight of myself in the mirror and realized I had become fat, which was something I hated because 
being an ethnic army person, I was very much into physical training, maintaining good shape, good figure, everything else, and avoiding looking in the mirror after my injury. And the care is not telling me that I was putting on weight because I thought I could just continue eating my food that I used to eat before, not realizing that I had to minimize the amount and avoid all the fatty stuff because before my injury, if I ate those things, I would just go exercise and I'd be fine. Not being able to exercise anymore because I have a C5 complete injury. That and sitting down 24 seven almost meant the weight was piling on. So it was very difficult. It's, it's, the, I, it's, it's oh, sorry, Simon. No, I was just going to say, Lady Marie has clearly come a hell of a long way from tracksuits and, and, and whatever in, in Istanbul <laughs> because she makes the rest of us look like Wurzel Gummidge. So knowing <laughs> she was going to be on the call, I didn't even bother getting dressed up today. I thought, oh, it's, it's a battle I'm never even going to bother trying to win. But anyway, sorry, carry on. I, well, I, I, you know, it rings true when you talk about kind of lounge wear and tracksuits. I was like, oh my goodness, that was me for about two years there when we were in <laughs> <laughs> at least on the bottom anyway. Um, so um, I, I, it's so interesting to hear about kind of um, the initial period because that, you know, being being discharged, I guess, is that moment where you're kind of, oh, God, everything's everything's different, everything's changed and that's that. Is that the most intensely kind of difficult adjustment phase? And then I wonder how um, your image, as you said, Lady Marie looking in the mirror for the first time and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Does that, ha you know, how quickly does that happen does it settle down and and that's good but I think to a degree that depends on the individual yeah and it depends on their circle of of family and circle of friends and how they treat you mm. um my friends don't treat me any differently than they did beforehand they're still rude to me they're still there's still a lot of banter goes on uh, and I wouldn't want it any other way nobody pussyfoots around me and being for me being treated like that meant that my integration back into quotes normal society was far easier because I was just Simon Pinnell yeah I wasn't Simon Pinnell in a wheelchair yeah so I think and, and that helps so having people treating you normally and, and and I you know impress upon friends and family to do that it's still the same person they're just sitting down yeah it, it, I agree with Simon, but for me, it was challenging because all of the friends I had disappeared. And so it was now having to develop relationships with new people and the majority. And even now, I would say I don't have friends, I have acquaintances. And so the carers were the friends. My family saw me as somebody helpless somebody who was bone china so you must treat them delicately and so all my high heels that I used to wear I gave them all away and all my my nice clothes I gave away until I found my own zone and I decided that okay I want people to see the person not the wheelchair yeah. And so I started to develop my own style. I realized that I needed to, whether I needed to design my own things and get, fortunately, I, I know people who are dressmakers. So if I saw something that I really liked, I would adapt it to mine. So I experienced swollen legs, for example. So I wear long skirts. But I get my, my dressmaker to make it for me. And I would buy a nice jacket. Combine the two, and you would never tell me that I'm not wearing a suit because they look the same. So okay. I would take the jacket to the the shop, match the material as closely, the color as closely as possible, get it made. And when I go out, you cannot tell me that you know people see me, not the chair. And that's what it's all about. So how how did you how did you get there, Lady Marie? Because you know it's as you say when you at, at first you. You, you felt totally differently. What was kind of the turning point for you in terms of how you saw yourself and how you wanted people to see you and that kind of sh shift up in confidence, I guess? You know, what triggered that? I suppose one of the things that helped was the fact that my daughter was six months old when I had my injury and I wanted her to see a confident mum. I wanted her to grow up as a confident person. 
so I then developed this, I don't know where the um, strength came from, I would say it's God, but others would say it's probably just me. I was never that much of a confident person until I joined the army. Um, but I think because, for example, my mom said when she, when I was the same injury, she said I it would have been better if I died because she felt not being able to use my hands or anything like that. Therefore, what's the point of me living? But then when she saw that turn in, turn in me where I suppose when I started to go out to go to college and so on, and I decided that, well, I like nice things. So what can I do? to make myself feel good. And it's a way of making me feel good and being more confident because I, I the image that some people have of wheelchair users are you're sitting in a wheelchair or crooked and your clothing are, are like old and frumpy. I've even had people say to me during this winter month, oh, why haven't you got a blanket over your knee? And that's the image. That's what people have of disabled people of which I use it. I'm like, you must be joking. I wouldn't be seen dead in, in <laughs> the <planet> of <laughs> and that, That's an interesting point as well that um, I wanted to touch on, which is how, how, does, how is self-image different? Do, do you think that there's a big difference between people that sustain their injuries when they're much younger or old? Or do you think it's... Are the struggles the same? And does, you know, social media is an absolute minefield for, you know, how does that play into it? I, I think you probably have to ask somebody who was young when they sustained their injury. I mean, I, I was mid forties when I had mine. So, um, that is young, Simon. Uh, well, <laughs> I was in my twenties. I'll, I'll bung you the five and later. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I, and I can, I can absolutely see the struggle, you know, for, for young people because at, at that age it's about you know you're setting out on life you're looking at you know new relationships with that you know potentially marriage and all of that sort of stuff and and unless you can get people to see as lady marie said to see you and not the wheelchair and and that's a, a, a big hurdle to get over you you've got that mental hurdle of i'm never going to be able to find anybody to have a, a, a long-term relationship with mm. um and I, I can absolutely understand why that would be a struggle for for somebody you know for for somebody young who sustains their spinal cord injury um and and you know along with all the other things that go with spinal cord injury that we know about bowel bladder skin all of that sort of stuff so sexual function and and body and self-image is just another one of those things um but i think it comes down to the way that you deal with it yourself um you know you can become that person that Lady Marie has described, uh, you know, with a blanket over your knees, hunched up in a wheelchair, um, watching when he comes back, Jeremy Kyle, because I think he's coming back on TV. There's a bloody good excuse to get back out working again, isn't it? If you, if you don't. Um, but, you know, there, there is a danger that you can regress into that. Um, so I think, you, you know, Lady Marie said she had a turning point. Everybody will have that point at some time. Yeah. Um, and the sooner you can find that point, I think the better. Yeah, because I think for young people who are spend so much time on social media, it will affect you. Yeah. Because even non-disabled people are affected. So how much more somebody with a disability? You know. So if you want to follow that route, then it will possibly take you longer to find your own zone, to find your own. You know, it's important to know who you are as an individual. Yeah. And to put more value on you than what, how other people value you because we can't change the mindset of people, but we can change our own mindset. Yes. Uh, spot on. I think, and the other thing that I think is worth noting is that there is a lot of stuff on social media for the non-disabled world about body image and things like that. But there is a degree of it within... The disability world as well mm -hmm. you know look you know bodybuilding you know sort of upper bodybuilding things and things like that you see so many you know some images and you know look how many reps this guy can do strapped to his wheelchair lifting himself up you know, all of that sort of stuff and that in itself can make somebody who is perhaps newly injured or you know a, a longer term injury feel inadequate mm -hmm. and so you know it, you don't just lose that once you become disabled there, there is some of that goes on as well so it's uh 
I think the struggles for us are, 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 are in, in that side of it, the same as anybody's uh, looking at, at, at self-image. Yeah, absolutely. And from what you've said, um, and something for us all to kind of think about watching this, um, the people around you, so carers, family, friends, you know, acquaintances, whatever, um, all play a pretty important role, don't they, yeah. in, in that in that process? Absolutely yeah, vital. Course. Yeah, definitely vital. But for for me, it's interesting that my carers or my family members will ask me for advice on how to dress. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> no, mate. Like, how does this look? Do you think it looks nice? Because I've got an eye for things like that. Yeah. Funny, Lady Marie, nobody ever asked me that. <laughs> He said wistfully. <laughs> well, I could talk to both of you all day about this, um, but we've 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 taken up all of our fifteen minutes. We're done. It goes so oh. fast. Uh, we could talk all day about this stuff. It is such an important topic, um, and I know there's some information on SIA website, um, some advice, and all sorts of stuff. So we'll make sure we have the links included for that. Thank you ever so much, Simon and Lady Marie, for coming today and just giving us the insight. Um, really appreciate it. Um, we'll make sure we didn't have time for questions. I didn't even mention questions because I knew we would be just talking the whole time. Um, but if you do have any questions, we'll make sure that um, Simon, Lady Marie's email address and my email address, of course, are included on the end slide on the recording. You've all got my details. You can email me anytime and we'll pass anything on. But thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you, Simon, Lady Marie, as well. Pleasure. Okay, everyone, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.